We are surrounded by forests and water and untamed land. This is what lures visitors to our great peninsula and draws some to even move here. Case in point, Tim and Lisa, who moved to the Keweenaw Peninsula permanently in 2017 to live a homestead lifestyle and reconnect with the land. We were just looking for some changes in our life. We had the typical 40 hour a week jobs and we knew at some point in time that we wanted to pursue more of a homesteading lifestyle and self-reliant lifestyle. And we were formerly from Wisconsin. We were just looking for property. We had never actually been to the Keweenaw before. And the moment we walked out here in our snowshoes in February, we just we knew loved it. it. We loved it. We knew it, it was to, meant to be ours. Right now, the coolest thing going on in Jacobsville is White Sky Woods and their back to basics lifestyle, animals, and of course, their yurt. We just found to be living in a yurt to be an awesome option for us. It was right in our price range and it provided a unique home for us. Yes, yeah, so the yurt actually came as a, sort of a kit. Um, each of the wall panels came pre-built and then the roof came with it as well. So that was uh, helpful since I didn't have a lot of time all at once to come and work because I was just working on like a, a week of vacation a year. I would come up and work or we would come up and work. Mm -hmm. So the second year was mostly just kind of uh, building out the inside and uh, getting the loft up and, and that kind of stuff. And then the third summer was getting like the cabinets in and the plumbing all finished up and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. The thing I really liked about the yurt that appealed to me the most was the fact that in nature, nothing is square. One of the huge appeals for us was to be able to just live a lifestyle that was healthier. Um, meaning providing the majority of our food, be it vegetables, fruits, and meat, um, and just knowing truly where our food came from and that it's organic. We have our garden, which is obviously to sleep right now for the winter, but we raise the majority of our own food here. Um, I would say probably about 75% of the food that we eat is homegrown by us or raised by us. So one of the things that we decided we wanted to do when we first moved here was since I would be coming out of the workplace that I would start homeschooling the kids. We do have awesome opportunities to do things that we wouldn't have time to do as a family otherwise. Tim is working with the kids on like a make it, build it sort of thing and they have different projects that are ongoing. And one of the big projects that they worked on this year is the kick sled. It's basically a chair on skis. Flora and I planned how to do it and went through a couple iterations before we decided on something that seemed actually to work good. We have to cut all our pieces of metal, and make them the right sizes and all that stuff. And then we attach them to the skis and attach all pieces of metal together. And we put the chair on. I feel like we have so many more life freedoms and having more family time and just being back in nature and back to the land. It just feels so good to be part of this. So the first two winters we were here, we used to have the animals out there. And after last winter, which was a really kind of, seemed, it was harsh is what we were told. We also felt that way. <laughs> and we decided that we should move all the animals a little bit closer to us, which would prevent us from having to haul all the water out there and all the feed and everything. So this last um, spring and summer, we worked on kind of retrofitting our garage to be um, the animal area for the goats and the chickens. And then the calves are on the other side of the lean-to. And then back there, we have the ducks and the rabbits as well. So that's been a huge help. Um, this is alder and this is juneberry. They're named after what they're hopefully go eating. <laughs> so juneberry and alders. Yeah, they just stay in here for winter time. It's a safe place for them. Otherwise, they walk out to pasture every day on a lead. Um, last year, we had a buck goat here as well, and they were bred and they had some kids. Each of them had one. And then we milked them for a while, and it was pretty excellent. So they are hopefully both pregnant again, and we'll be expecting in May, so we'll have baby goats and fresh milk all over again. In summer, we'll sell duck eggs and chicken eggs to our neighbors and friends. 
because um, we have a whole bunch usually in summer, but in winter they kind of take a break from laying. And they all have names. What are their names? Um, well, this one here, she's black and she has white spots. She's kind of, yeah. Um, her name's Stella. She had a nest and she had one little baby duck. His name, her name is JJ. She's gray, not like her mom at all. Um, and then we have Blanche. She's the brown duck, the only brown duck right now. And then we got the two big gray ducks with white spots on their chests. They're um, Chase and Astrid. They're both Swedish blues. And then I have, I named these ones Speckle, Speckled, and then I call one, one's Luna. She's one of the babies, and so is Speckle and Speckled. And then the other one I call Nancy. I don't know why, just I thought it was a fun name for her. They lay eggs, and I personally like duck eggs better than chicken eggs. They're creamier to me, and they're bigger too. Sometimes we get a duck egg that's double yolked, and those are really big. And then the rabbits, we usually have larger colony of rabbits in summer because it's easier for them to raise their babies and so forth then. So, but the rabbits are colony raised, which means they get to freely range through here and live more like a rabbit would want to than in a cage. This, this is Dapple, she's one of our moms. So we do sell meat rabbit as well. And that has been um, surprisingly, to me, a whole bunch of people have been interested in that. So that's been a pretty cool thing to be able to provide healthy local meat that's humanely raised to people that we know in the community. Rabbit meat tastes like the best chicken you'll ever have. It's basically just a very lean white meat and you can prepare it just like chicken and pretty much any meal that you make. So. Um, we personally just like to put it in the crock pot because we're a busy family and then um, meat falls off the bone and you have a wonderful shredded um, type of meat and you can make like barbecue sandwiches with it um, or make soups with it it's, or stews. It's really, really tender and good. So we keep the boys in the hutches. This one is Tracker. He's the father of most of the babies. Hey buddy, come on over. <laughs> the calves are about nine months old right now. Even though they're technically training to be oxen, they won't be oxen until a couple of years from now. That's just more of a term for when they reach maturity. And so in the meantime, there are calves or working steer is what they'd be called. And we had a really bad storm here in November and lots of trees came down. So. We're excited um, for the spring thaw so we can get out there and just uh, start cutting up wood and have them haul in our timber for us. Come up. Come up. In summer, they were training every day, but in winter, it's been a little more challenging because the road can get kind of slick and the fields aren't available. So we train every couple days in winter, but they are, I was amazed at how smart they are. We have zero experience raising cows or any animals before we made this life transition. So it's been pretty cool to just see how intelligent and responsive they are and how much they really like to work. Tim and Lisa's homestead is in Jacobsville on the southeast corner of the Keweenaw on the mouth of the Portage Canal. Jacobsville is known for the sandstone quarries that provided building material for many of the Copper Country's buildings. This sandstone also made its way to many cities on the East Coast. One of the things Lisa and Tim love about their property is that history scattered about their 240 acres and they enjoy sharing it with others. This trail is unique. It's not a winding through the woods sort of trail. Um, but what makes it unique is that it has a pretty big history to it. Um, as far as we understand, this railroad grade used to haul out Jacobsville sandstone, which is what Jacobsville area is known for. Not a lot going on here now, and there's no active sandstone quarries, but 120 years ago, there were people out here actively quarrying sandstone. And it's just really neat to walk on here and think like, Who's coming down this trail and what were they hauling and where was it going? Where, what building did it end up being in? It's hard to see in winter, but we actually have 
sandstone all along the side on this trail. That was probably just scrap stone that wasn't of any value. And so you can kind of see history as you walk through it. To the best of our knowledge, that's a hill of scrap. Um, so kind of like uh, what a rock pile would be from the copper mines, the poor rock. What we believe is underneath that is poor rock sandstone. Um, we have multiple of those around on this property. And what probably happened is they dumped a pile, kept dumping on it, and then progressively it leads right to the quarry. Here is one of the quarry ponds that's on our property. It, we know it's a quarry pond for 100% certainty because we've read about it in books, but also straight back that way, which we're intending to put a trail to, there are massive slabs of sandstone that have been cut out and stacked. And then I don't know if the market fell out or what happened, but they got left behind for whatever reason. Um, but it's pretty cool. A lot of them have kind of toppled over a little bit. So there's some cool crevices over there. But we do love coming out here in summer and just relaxing and listen to the quiet of it all. You literally cannot hear traffic back here. And to me, that's probably the perfect thing. <laughs> As part of our snowshoe tour, we did a little foraging to make some tea. And one of our favorite things to harvest is um, the spruce needles or pine needles work great too. And we've made spruce needle tea and um, pine needle tea and then spruce needle cookies as well. And it has kind of, to me, almost like a citrusy flavor. So we will pick some of this and we can head inside and warm up a little bit and have some fresh tea. And the benefit of the spruce is a high quantity of vitamin A and vitamin C. And as with any sort of harvesting we do out in nature, we always make sure we pick only a sustainable amount, although we have lots of spruce. I wouldn't want to come pick too much off this tree. And then I always say thanks because what a cool thing that nature is able to provide us. So let's go have a taste. I'm gonna go ahead and put our spruce needles. I collected a few pine ones as well. So we're gonna load up this pot. And so people often ask like, how much should I put in? Well, I honestly, I don't measure this. <laughs> I kind of just pick and put it in and then I steep it um, for a couple minutes. If it's a little strong, I just, um, water it down a little bit more. If it needs more, I'll add more once I've been having it steeped for a while. It's not like I'm using this medicinally, so I don't worry so much about it being a specific type of... I can smell it already just having poured the water on that. So we'll let those steep for a couple minutes and then we'll give it a try. I just look forward to the opportunity to just share like our homesteading lifestyle with people who maybe have an interest in it or just uh, want to see what that life is like. If you're interested in learning more about White Sky Woods, their homestead, or taking a guided snowshoe tour, visit their website, whiteskywoods.com. <laughs>